Today, we talk about a man, wealthy, but from humble beginnings, noble, yet petty, a man who could purchase anything, except for what he most desired. Was he a communist? A fascist? What is undeniable is that he was an American citizen. I'm India Randawa, and this is I Love This, You Should Too. You didn't like that? I did a little Aaron Menke. Oh, that was good. I like that. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> I was going for a bit of Phoebe Judge. I'm Phoebe Judge. <laughs> <laughs> but you're not. You're no. Samantha Randawa, my lovely co-host. And um, yeah, normally I don't start like that, but we were just doing a fun little thing. Yeah. And this is I Love This You Should Too, a member of the Alberta Podcast Network, which is locally grown and community supported. How are you doing today, Sam? I'm great. It's right. hot. It's summer. Life is good. It is. Well... Usually. Life is fine. <laughs> Life is fine. And that's kind of a, uh, a fitting message for today's movie. Yeah. So today uh, we are going to be talking about Citizen Kane. I keep trying to introduce the podcast like, oh, this is going to be the episode that a lot of people like listen to because, you know, Citizen Kane, it's so big. Nobody cares about Citizen <laughs> Kane. Not many people are going to listen to this one. But in case this is your first one. How this works, Samantha and I take turns presenting different movies to the other. This was my pick. It's something that Samantha had never seen and probably wouldn't on her <laughs> own volition, but I kind of made her watch it, and we're going to break it down today. And today we will be a spoiler-filled episode. So many spoilers. Yeah. Spoilers. Spoilers. Of course, you should watch the movie before you listen to this, but I feel like for a lot of people, Citizen Kane is so spoiled already. Maybe this will be what uh, pushes you into finally watching it. Yeah. I guess a small spoiler alert. I think it's worth watching. <laughs> you're going to watch it and you're going to like it. Before we get into everything, let's thank our first sponsor of the episode. And that is the Alberta Blue Cross. Even if you're a busy business owner with more meetings than hours in a day, you can be calm and collected when your group benefit plan is taken care of by Alberta Blue Cross. Your employees can manage their own health, dental, life, and disability coverage online, anytime, on any device, making it easier for them and for you. To learn more about Alberta Blue Cross and explore your options, head to ab.bluecross.ca. So for a lot of these real big ones, I often do research and stuff and write a whole bunch. I didn't really do that this time because I feel like some of the stories about Citizen Kane are so well known that everyone knows them. Mm -hmm. But then I also have to think that I'm someone who, you know, studied film. Right. So I don't think everyone knows them. But I think they're in my head enough that I can go back to those when we need to. Yeah. But... If you research Citizen Kane, you're probably going to find the same stories a lot. So I think it might just be better that I didn't do the pre-work and <laughs> that we can just talk about the movie. Yeah. But one thing I did do is we have a little format to today's episode. <laughs> so we will each talk about our first impressions of the movie, whether we loved it or not. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a little bit of context into the movie, including Orson Welles, who he is, how he got this movie. And a little bit about uh, William Randolph Hearst, because that is kind of important about how this movie was released, and it's kind of fun, too. Then we can do a little bit of technical stuff, which most people won't care about, but I'll just give you some uh, fun little parts about the, the set, the sound, the composition, and the cinematography. And then I think mostly we'll just talk about Kane the man. Like, what do you think of him? We will talk about his relationships, probably mostly with the with Susan Alexander, because that's the one we spend the most time with mm -hmm. in the movie. And, of course, we have to talk about Rosebud. Rosebud! Because now you know. Now I know. I know the secret. Yeah. So I want to ask before we even ask about uh, if you loved it or not, did you see a bunch of things in this movie when you're like, oh, that's where that's from? Kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's parodied so often. Yeah. And even things we don't know, when you we talk about how this movie was made, you're like, oh, they were the first to do that? That's just a thing that's in mm -hmm. all movies now. But we'll talk about that. So then, Samantha, your first time watching this, did you love it? No. 
I kind of felt that was coming. I, this is another one where, like, I really appreciated some of the references to other things that I know from, like, pop culture. But I kind of felt like I was on the outside of it. I get that. I get that. In fact, like, 20 minutes into this movie, maybe more, maybe 30 minutes in. And it's a two-hour movie. Yeah. I thought, like, oh, I made a mistake. This is, like, an important movie historically. It's not good. <laughs> it And then, yeah. and then, I changed my mind. I got into it. When they started talking about him, and it's not just the news on the march anymore. Yeah. When they get into it, and I see the complexities of the character, I got into it. Hmm. Because... Yeah, looks beautiful. I love all the set stuff, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But that's not enough. There are pretty movies all over the place. Mm-hmm. And sure, you're the first one to do certain things or the first one to do all of the things in one movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's impressive, but that doesn't make you the best movie ever. And this movie, when I say, like, oh, widely considered by, like, BFI and the American Film Institute, all of those things have ranked it number one for, like, 80 years now. So they think it's important for a reason. Yes. And I get all the technical stuff. What I was very happy with is about an hour in, I was just in it. Mm-hmm. I wasn't on the outside anymore. I wasn't a film student looking at it like, oh, that's what they did there. That's really cool. I was just like, who's this guy? Yeah. Who is Charles Foster Kane? And I got interested in all the nuance and complexity of the character and how it's told. Mm-hmm. How we're getting everyone's point of view. So is that even true? Because we're, it's all stories, right? right? Are the stories fully true? Because every character was able to illuminate like a different part of his character. Mm-hmm. And then let's talk a little bit about the end right now. The reveal with, of Rosebud. Yeah. How did that work for you? Um, I think it was kind of cool. It was a cool way to do it. You did see him like, oh. Yeah, yeah. Was, it wasn't like, wow, that's stupid. It was very interesting to see how they made it almost insignificant to the point of like the whole thing and how it, like that secret was going to die with him, basically. I might take issue with insignificant because I think that it was his driving force through the movie. Okay, so insignificant might be the wrong word. I meant like it wasn't this huge big reveal of like, ha ha, we found it. Okay, yeah. It was like quiet and like the viewer is like rosebud. Yeah. I get it. Yeah, so it wasn't like... They had a press conference. We figured out what Rosebud was. It was here. It was this. It's interesting because it's not something that's left ambiguous. We do find out literally what Rosebud is. But it's not exactly closure on the significance. Of course, we'll both have our own views of why we think Rosebud was significant. Do you you have a, a hot take um, because it was like the last part of his old life. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the like with his mother and everything. Probably the most accepted and like probably most right. Yeah. Answer, but I think there's a lot more nuance to it, of course, because the way they did kind of settle things, like mm-hmm. you were talking about, was not a throwaway, but it was just like, oh yeah, and this. It was like quietly at the end. Yeah. It wasn't like as big as the rest of the movie. It shows you that yeah, that's what it is, but. Is it a resolution? No. Yeah. Yeah. That was, and that's interesting to me. I found that interesting too. Um, and I agree with you in what you were saying that this is like, it's an important movie. Mm-hmm. I just don't think it's like a great movie. <laughs> Did you find it enjoyable? I enjoyed parts of it. Okay. In a overall, is it a thumbs up, thumbs down? It was a tentative thumbs up i'll take that <laughs> yeah like it, it it had some moments where i was like eh, and other moments where i was like okay this is cool i get this all right so yeah well we'll go through the movie or at least uh, thematically maybe yeah and you can tell me what was that eh, and what was that oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> You really need to see our facial expressions when we do stuff like this oh i feel like that was enough okay eh. me oh <laughs> It is interesting, though, like how you were talking about, like, yeah, I get that it's important, but like now movies 
progress, mm-hmm. right? It's hard to get people now to watch old movies and appreciate them. Yeah. And I get why technology has changed, but it's not like that with um, paintings. Right. If you say, like, oh, who's your favorite, like, modern painter? A lot of people have a harder time. But yeah. if you say, like, oh, what's, like, the best painting? And everyone's like, oh, I don't know, Mona Lisa. Even if you don't know art, you right. have big names, and those names are always old. Mm-hmm. It's odd that film doesn't do that. We're always like, old stuff is boring. It's yeah. black and white. It's not as good. And I wonder if it is just straight technology. It could be because everything else is so technologically advanced now that watching something like that seems kind of slow and quiet. Yeah. The pacing is slow. And I think even for 41, it is a slow and quiet might not be a bad way to explain Mm -hmm. it at the time. I think these techniques that he used as far as the, the pacing and the like literal sound were really adopted by a lot of European filmmakers throughout the 50s and 60s. Mm. But you can see that influence a lot. And I think that was not just a product of like, oh, it's the 40s, everything's slower. Right. The cuts and things were definitely slower in this movie. But I think that is Orson Welles, not 1941. Right. Because he's coming from a theater background and making these longer takes, something that we had never seen Mm -hmm. at this point. And he's letting the camera move sometimes and letting people go on and do full scenes without cutting and without using focus or editing to drive home the point he was Mm -hmm. letting people do that right but we're not even at that part of the podcast yet sorry i got i got a little excited (laughs) back it up (laughs) i think what it comes down to for my opinion of this movie i thought like yeah i know it's a good movie and it's an important movie Mm -hmm. and then i started watching it didn't think it was that great And then I did, and the more I talk about it, the more I convince myself that it's a good movie just for watching. Right. Like, sure, it's important, but we're even outside of the importance to cinema. I think it's just kind of a good movie. It was fun. It Mm. had its moments. All right. Well, let's... uh, (laughs) Sorry, I'm not giving you as much as I think you want. (laughs) No, I think that's legitimate. Okay. I think if you're like, yeah, it was fine, but and it's important, but I don't grasp onto those same character things that you do that's that's valid yeah i think the character work this movie as a character study is severely underrated and i don't know how you can say like anything about the best movie ever made is underrated but (laughs) i think that is and we're doing too much praising of the the technical stuff right like you can't look up an article on citizen kane without the words deep focus being in the first 20 because it's such a big thing and it was a pioneer of the course but i think it's underrated as a story Hmm. okay i think the story is uh better than we think but let's talk about another really interesting (laughs) story and how this movie was made okay so i'll tell you a little bit about yeah tell me tell me so orson wells is Uh the uh, writer director star of this movie okay yep before we get into anything what did you think of just his performance i thought it was good I really liked him. I I didn't expect young Orson Welles to be like, he's a fucking movie star. Yeah. He looks great. He's charming. He's engaging. He's charismatic. I was drawn, especially, I wish there was more scenes with young Kane because he's so like lively and engaging. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, you. if you had told me that this was someone who'd only ever like written or directed something, I wouldn't no well he was an actor oh he, he was, was an a actor. theater actor oh this okay. is his first movie that's wild writing directing acting <laughs> that's wild so um in the years before this we're talking in the 30s now uh late 30s he had become pretty famous for these political confrontational avant-garde um plays So he did this version of Macbeth, which was set in Haiti and had an all-black cast in like 1938. Wow. And he did this modern dress version of Julius Caesar, where it was like a fascist dystopia. And he had like a pro-union musical that he did, which was shut down by the government before it ever aired, not aired, was performed. Wow. So he was doing daring and interesting stuff. Uh, he also worked on a, um adaptation of Richard Wright's Native Son, which I've read that novel and I think it's an amazing novel. I don't know if that ever got made either. But again, um, a story 
from a black writer. Mm -hmm. So he's doing things that are not often being done. Do you know about his whole War of the Worlds thing? No. Do you never hear- Was that the radio thing that everyone thought was like real? That's Orson Welles. Okay. So in uh, 1938, for CBS Radio, he does a presentation of H.G. Wells's War of the Worlds. And it's played out like a series of news bulletins of like, oh my God, this is happening right, right. now. And they say at the beginning, of course, like here is this uh, production of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. But if you tune in in the middle. It's scary. Yeah. You- the story itself and how the story has changed is very indicative of like our internet culture. Mm-hmm. Because I grew up hearing, do you know, like everyone believed it and it caused mass panic? Yeah. That's what I believed, right? Yeah. You heard that as well? I heard that too, yeah. And then once the internet became a thing, it's like, you know, that's just a story. Nobody believed that. No one's that dumb, right? And the truth is, of course, in the middle, lots of people believed it. Mm-hmm. In fact, they, oh, where was it now? I think it was in Argentina. Another um, radio guy did the same thing. And caused mass panic, and people were so angry, they like he got killed. Like, they came to the radio station, burned it down, and killed Oh my him. god. But that's another thing. It might not be Argentina, so don't quote me on that. Is that another country, though? Yeah, it was South America, I'm pretty sure. Hmm. And uh, so he did that, and people, yeah, bought in. And he was famous for his radio and stage productions. And he was 24 when, in 1939, he signed a contract with RKO, pictures who made Mm -hmm. citizen kane that said you can write direct produce and star in two movies and you get final cut final cut meaning like you decide what this looks like at the end oh wow because a lot of directors direct a movie but if they don't have final cut lots of things get chopped out changed around they don't have a say on that right so that's a big deal it is a big deal okay yeah so at this point no one had ever had that deal it was he was the first like in silent era people did that like charlie chaplin was like that i'm sure dw griffith could do whatever he wanted but that's silent film it's a very different thing right now as you know from watching ed wood ed wood also had that but uh <laughs> it was different kind of way? different kind of different <laughs> yeah in the sense that i also have that if i just make a movie yeah. in my backyard but that's kind of ed wood's style so hollywood gave one young artist and like artist Mm -hmm. not a movie maker not a cinema guy an artist the ability to do whatever they wanted and it resulted in maybe the best film ever made Mm -hmm. and we won't do it again (laughs) isn't that crazy that's wild and it was seen as a failure and he would never get that kind of power again in his life how is this a failure? Like, I know, like I said, like, I felt like I was on the outside, but this is like, it's a good movie. How is anything a failure in business? Oh, yeah. Didn't make money. Right. And the reason didn't make money is because a lot of Citizen Kane is loosely based, and quite loosely, if you really look at it, yeah. on the life of William Randolph Hearst, right. who was a... um. Do you know, what what is he? He's yeah. like a media magnate. Yeah, and he, like megalomaniac, yeah. and um, just like a real piece of shit. And his daughter was kidnapped. Oh yeah, I forgot about <laughs> Patty that. Hearst. Yeah, and then she like was like, you know, no, I wasn't kidnapped. I went on my own, and I'm part of this now. Yeah. So um, yeah, there's a that's a whole another story, and we won't get too much into Hearst, but what we can say and how it affects this movie is that. He believed it was about him. So, and he's a real piece of shit. Yeah. So what he did was he tried to pressure RKO into just burning the picture, never releasing it. Right. And he um, just straight up extorted people. He had enough people working in... Film? In Hollywood in general, reporters and stuff. And he said, like, I know enough about you that... I'll ruin your life. Mm -hmm. I'll put every story about each one of you into all of my papers and you're never going to work in this town again. Mm -hmm. It says, so I'm reading off Britannica.com, which seems like a a reputable source. Sure. That William Randolph Hearst shaped the current practice of American journalism. So he basically created journalism. (laughs) He created the current practice of journalism, which is the owner of a newspaper directs the opinions of the people yes not the uh, practices of journalism but i think of of media as we know it Mm -hmm. in 
Because journalism makes me think of like going out there and finding the truth. Yes. That seems like journalism to me. That's not Hearst. No. Hearst is like, oh, you idiots love this. This is what I'm going to give you. And I'm going to make you think what I want to think. And like the 24-hour news cycle. Yeah. 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 He's the Rupert Murdoch of his time. Yes. Yeah. So he said, we'll tell everyone all of your secrets. Uh, We're also going to start an anti-immigrant and anti-Semitic campaign in all of my newspapers because... So many of the filmmakers were Jewish or they were refugees from Europe because this is uh, just pre-World War II. Mm, yeah. And like I always talk about, all those German filmmakers came over and brought all their fun German expressionism to what we now call film noir or horror or Citizen King. Right. And so then most of the theaters in the countries were controlled by the studios, refused to show Citizen Kane Mm -hmm. because of Hearst. And because of all of that, it did not get a very wide opening and didn't make a lot of money. So then it was nominated for nine Oscars and it only won one for its screenplay. And a lot of people say like it only got that because of uh, uh, Wells' co-writer Mankiewicz Herman? Mank. They just call him Mank. And there's a movie called Mank now where Gary Herman Oldman plays J. him. Herman J. Mankiewicz. Yes. <laughs> so they said because he like is, a, is an interesting story and there's a whole movie about him. But he was well respected and had written a lot and is a very talented writer. So this was kind of an, a lifetime achievement award for him. So mm-hmm. that's the only award it won. And Hearst had paid a bunch of people that whenever Kane was... Mentioned in nominations in any of its nine categories, everyone just booed. Hmm. So it was booed at the Oscars. Wow, that's that's big. And it was booed in its cinematography. And like, it's, you can love this movie or hate it. It looks amazing now, yeah. and especially it did in 1941. That's very cool. And I mean, it had some really cool sets. Like, the sets are like are the something, yeah. big sweeping panoramic views of, what is it? Narnia? Xanadu. Xanadu. Okay, let's get let's get into that then. So okay. we're done with Hearst. But one thing to add on is uh, Hearst dies in 51. In the mid-50s, they do a re-release of Citizen Kane. And within two years of that, it's widely regarded as the best film ever made. Wow. Whether or not it is, we're not... Well, actually, we, maybe we will talk about Maybe <laughs> we'll decide at the end. Oh, okay. But many people thought it was... And because Hearst wasn't alive and his money didn't mean anything anymore, people could watch it and make up their own mind. Yeah. So let's get into that kind of uh, the technical stuff. We'll talk a little bit about, I think the sets are one thing. Yeah. The camera work, the cinematography, and a little bit of the sound too. Yeah. So what did you think of the look of this movie? I thought it looked really cool for a movie this old. Yeah. Um, I think that the scale of the sets as well as how they made this house f- feel and look huge mm-hmm. without making a house that big. Yeah. And you'd be amazed of what is real in this movie and what isn't. Huh. Because I think 1941, like, how do you make a big room? You build a big room. Yeah. He didn't. There's so many tricks in this movie that there's there's special effects in this movie. What? You don't see any special effects, but in almost every interior scene, which is the vast majority of the movie, there's something that's not real or has some sort of maybe trickery is the best word for it. That's cool. And like really innovative for the time, I'm assuming. Yeah, definitely. Because I feel like a lot of those things were based on, like, like on the lot, the movie lot. Yeah. That's a thing, right? Yes. Yeah, especially <laughs> in this time. This is, like, the golden yeah. age of the studio system. Where you got, like, yeah, you got, like, Bunker 12 or whatever yeah. it is, and then you build your movie inside of that. Yeah. So this is the first thing that he had directed for a film, and he had kind of this naivety that made things great because he was smart enough to go out and get, I forget his first name. I think it might be Greg, but Toland was the name of the cinematographer and he's just good. Mm -hmm. He's great. He does amazing work and has like a really interesting story in his own life. Like he was like a party maniac, this dude apparently. Oh really? Yeah. But all of these things I'm remembering from when I learned about this movie when I was like 18 
Right. So that was uh, some years ago. So a lot of these stories are like, is that really what I heard? But I, that's what I think I remember. Hmm. So he hired him and Wells doesn't know the limitations of film. Right. He's never done it before. So he's like, can we do this? And told him <laughs> rather than normally directors would never ask such a thing mm-hmm. because they know you can't do that. And Toland was like, yeah, let me figure out how. And they invented or at least perfected a lot of techniques that hadn't been seen before. Oh, that's very so cool. So this movie was meticulously planned for months in pre-production. They experimented everything with this camera that they hadn't used before, or Toland had, I guess, and um, even film development techniques. And one of the biggest things you'll hear about this is deep focus. Right. And deep focus just means if one guy is in the bottom right-hand corner of the movie and there's someone a few feet back from them and then there's a window way in the back and there's something going on in that window, every one of those things is in focus. And that never really had been done. Huh. And it seems like, why not? That's how I see the world, right? And that's one of the really important innovations because this was one of the first movies to look like the human eye. Interesting. That's something that if you aren't looking for, you're like, yeah, why wouldn't that be a thing? But like, we could get really technical, but all I'll say is the way that film sensitivity and lenses and cameras of the time worked the only way they could do this is having giant, giant lights on people all the time. So this movie looks dark. If you were there, it would be like the sun. Oh, wow. Because that's the only way they could get as deep of a depth of field and still work on 24 frames a second. Huh. Yeah. It's a kind of like stage. Yeah. Because like exactly. being and on stage is sometimes like being on the sun. Right. And in film, it is a, a, a lot as well, but mm-hmm. not like this. Right. These were crazy powerful lights. And he had that stage background. So he's like, why don't we just shine a sh- huge spotlight on that kid who's in that window? And people were like, yeah, well, I, I guess we could. And <laughs> people never thought of it because like films were made by filmmakers before. Right. So there was that, and um, then being able to shoot long takes that wouldn't have a lot of cutting. Mm -hmm. That wasn't easy to do because these cameras are huge. So if you want to move a camera, that's not easy. So you have to cut. You have to show a different angle. Right. Or if you're talking to someone who's next to you or behind you, we have to cut to show a close-up of them to get them in focus. Right. But he's being able to focus on all of these things and to move a camera around. You also have to remember that... This is near, not too far away from the beginning of sound. These cameras are loud. They're kind of as loud as a lawnmower. And to record audio at the same time and have all of these lights, there's a lot going on. No kidding. Wow. As loud as a lawnmower. That would be really annoying. Yeah. I wear, like, noise-canceling headphones when I mow the lawn because I hate the sound of our really quiet lawnmower. Like, yeah. We have a pretty quiet lawnmower, but, and yeah. And this camera is also, like, hand-cranked. Oh, man. (laughs) So they had all these systems of like kind of putting a balloon around the camera to to dampen the sound so you could still record audio. Oh, cool. But one of the things I really loved is how many things are in two parts in this movie. Because we start uh, this movie with an impossible crane shot, Mm -hmm. right? The camera starts on this fence and keeps going up and up and up and we see a a different fence and then we see the house and we go through the fence. Right. How do you do that? First, that lift up. Right. How do you lift a camera 60 feet in the air that's that heavy? Well, you don't. That is three separate shots and they literally cut the film where one ends and paste the other part over it. Old timey editing. Like you cut and paste was <laughs> yeah. literally a thing, that was right? Wild. <laughs> so that makes it look like the camera is raising sixty feet when in fact it's raising what, like ten feet six times or something like yeah. that. Also, it's not raising sixty feet. That's all miniatures. Oh, so you just yeah. Also, that house, there's no house. That's a painting. It's a painting? It's a matte painting. What? Yeah. Wild. And they would cut out holes and put light in the back to see, like, illumination and stuff like that. That's, a leg blowing, you're blowing my mind. And then, like, how do you go through that fence? There's no drone. That fence comes apart. All of, there's so many instances in this movie 
where there's a table that the camera goes through or it's actually tracking backwards and then there's a table in front of you you're like wait how is this that table there this isn't a small camera like we have now this is a huge camera there's so many things in this movie that are built into pieces and there's as the camera moves around there's people moving furniture taking things apart and putting them together to let the camera through and you don't know these things because like why would you because we don't have those problems now you, you can have a camera the size of your hand. That's no problem. You have flying, literal flying cameras now. Yeah. So we don't have to do deal with all of those things like they did now. But when you appreciate those things, you're like, yeah, sure, it's impressive for the time because they had to. But they had to for many years. A lot of those techniques that have changed are in the last 15, 20 years as digital became bigger, cameras became smaller and mm-hmm. all of that. We didn't have those options. So things like even Star Wars mm-hmm. is borrowing techniques that were employed in this in 1941. Wow. Another really fun thing. <laughs> this is one of the first movies, the first American movie to show a ceiling. A ceiling. You're going to show ceilings before. Sets well, didn't have ceilings. I was going to say those kind of sets wouldn't have had ceilings. Yeah. It's like sitcoms still don't have ceilings. Yeah. Same thing. Another reason is... Uh, how would you get the camera that low to the ground? Cameras were huge. Right. They dug holes to put cameras in so they could get the camera real low to the ground to get those shots where Kane is like larger than life and right. he's looming over this case. And in those giant rooms. and Yeah. yeah. To show that ceiling, which may or may not have been there. They often did uh, like double exposure where they would have something just blacked out mm. in their scene. There's scenes where there's two people talking. Those people are not in the same room. What? Because you can't light them that way. Mm. It just wasn't possible to get them that sharp. So they would have it like masked out a black area, like a physically black area that they shot. And then they would like know where that black area is, shoot the reverse with the other part blacked out for another person, and then put it together and like do it enough time that the sound would match up. It's magic. It's crazy. It's movie magic. It really is. <laughs> yeah, I loved all of those giant rooms. Like, remember that fireplace? Yeah. And you don't know how big the fireplace is because it's it's big, but it's in the background. Yeah. And then Kane walks for like 10 seconds and you're like, wait a minute. He keeps getting smaller, but the fireplace doesn't, of course. Yeah. And it's a fireplace where he's like the size of one of the logs. I was saying when we looked... At, like when we were watching it, I was like, that fireplace is like bigger than the bedroom in our condo. It was a, a walk in fireplace. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was wild. Like, I know there are fireplaces that I've seen in like palaces. Yeah. Are the ones where like you can like cook a full meal on the side and have like a pig roasting and then like also, you know, your laundry drying and like all of the things in the fireplace. So. I, uh, I've i seen fireplaces like that, but it was very cool to see him in one. And I, I don't know. I don't have like a lot of knowledge of the set, but I would bet that's, that fireplace isn't that big and wasn't there. Right. I think it's probably a, uh, a second image mm. of a fireplace that they made bigger for that. Right. Cool. Also because the light would have had to have been so much on Kane that the fireplace couldn't give off that much light to look bright. Right. Because that room would have been so, so bright, actually, and it looks mm-hmm. dark there. So I don't think you could do that. Hmm. Magic. Yeah. Lighting's fun. You're blowing my mind. <laughs> this is magical. Cool, right? Like, wow, that's really hard to do, but like, to what end? Yeah. If you're just doing it to be fancy, there's no point in it. But like right off the beginning, we have that scene with the fence, which is amazing in so many different ways. That we're including painting, we're stitching film together, we're doing break apart fences. But thematically, that's so important too. Because it's so long and so guarded before we see Kane. Right. And isn't that kind of the point of this movie? Yeah. Like you're trying to know this man, but there's a lot stopping you from knowing him. And they set that up in the first, whatever it is, 30 seconds of the movie. Yeah. That you're going to know him or you're going to try. It's not going to be easy. Huh. Huh. And then just Xanadu is really cool. It looks like something that a pharaoh would build. Yeah. It was like, it seemed really cool. I want to go there. Yeah. I would pay a lot of money to stay there. I would rather go there than like, I've been to Versailles. I want to see Xanadu. I've been to Versailles too. Yay. Versailles (laughs) Versailles buddies. Um, but I want to see Xanadu with its giant 
menagerie of animals. Magic animals, yeah. And then that deep focus, I think, was really useful in... It's probably something people don't notice, but the main character, or at least the person telling the story, is a reporter. Mm-hmm. What's his name? I don't know. Yeah, me neither. Huh. And he's always in the bottom right-hand corner of a lot of the scenes. Yeah. Do you know what he looks like? No. Yeah, me neither. He's got that, like, old-timey reporter voice, though. Yeah, and he's always shadowed out. Yeah. And... I think the depth of focus allows him to be there, but also see who he's talking to and usually what's going on behind them. Right. And I think that's important because, well, we need to see who he's talking to. Yep. And what's going on behind them often informs their point of view. And having the reporter in the bottom right-hand corner makes it like this person is talking to us. They are Mm. telling us the story. And we are the reporter, in this movie, right? Yeah. I th- this is a technique that's used a lot that, like, there's always an audience's way in. We have the point of view of a certain character in a lot of movies. And we are the reporter in this because this is set up as a mystery right from right. the beginning. And he's tasked with a go find out what this means. Right. And that's what we're tasked with, yeah. with, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have to go find out what is going on. And I think putting us in the position of this essentially faceless reporter mm-hmm. is, a, is a really good way to do that. Hmm. It makes us part of the story. It makes you invested, or at least it did for me. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. That That's a good way to put it. You're so much more eloquent about movies than I am. Oh, thank you. But a lot of it is language, right? I watched movies. I made some movies. I studied film. So I have the language for doing things. Yeah for explaining what I feel like. But when it comes to when I do those episodes on music, I don't have the training. I can just tell you what I like and how I feel. Yeah. I'm like, movies, nice, good look. But to be fair, (laughs) movies, nice, and also good look. Good luck. Yeah. And then these giant spaces. Like, well, what's the point of a big giant space? You show you can do it and you show he's rich. And that's great. Mm -hmm. But there's more to it than that. I feel like the spaces get more cavernous as we go on throughout the movie like yeah. we start off in the the little cabin right mm-hmm. out in the woods or not in the woods but out in the snow yeah and that's the smallest space we're gonna see mm-hmm. um there is susan's place which i think is important that that's small as well later because that's his trying to return to that childhood world oh yeah right but we'll talk about susan and the fact that they get more and more cavernous just shows like the increased emptiness of his life i'd argue Mm -hmm. and there's this one scene with his uh, first wife where there's a shot of them they're at a table having breakfast and then we can tell time's passing because they're having several different arguments but they're never shown on screen together it's him and then her and then him and then her and then when we get the camera finally coming back to where it was at the beginning the table has gotten a lot bigger yeah and they're sitting on separate sides of it and if you also look, he's reading his newspaper and she's reading one of the uh, competitor newspapers. Right, yeah. So, like, they use film language to convey something really eloquently. They just show this picture of two people sitting far away from each other on one table. Mm-hmm. And that's all you need to know. Yeah. And, of course, it's obvious now. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't always obvious. This type of semiotics, this type of symbolism wasn't always granted yeah fair yeah i liked that because you can see they're like slowly moving out of their like or what's it called like honeymoon phase yeah and they slowly start to just kind of exist together just intimacy disappears with them and then we get this i don't like business arrangement kind of marriage that they have yeah yeah so it was that's a good way to put it and it's funny that you subliminally get that as the table gets longer and that's just a thing with Kane I feel like with so many parts of his life it starts off in the small in the intimate and the longer things go the more empty they become the more sterile the more business like and is this a criticism of capitalism perhaps (laughs) I don't know maybe it's in there it's in there and he didn't have this, like, unlimited budget. He had a, a big budget for a guy doing his first movie, for mm-hmm. sure. But what he did with that budget at that time was still amazing. And what he didn't 
have the ability to do visually, he has this radio background. So he used a lot of really fun audio cues to do it. He has this history of making movies, or sorry, not movies, uh, radio plays with uh, dungeons and crypts and that kind of stuff. Like a lot of those old melodramas that yeah. were like big on radio in the 30s. Yeah. So he brings those voice effects into this. So you have that echo in a room, which isn't big at all. He's doing that. I don't know how you do that. Because now I just do it on my computer. <laughs> Yeah. But I don't know how he makes things sound all cavernous and echoey. Yeah. Was there like a way to do that? I'm sure there was a way to do that. He did it. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. I don't know how. Yeah. Yeah. So he was doing that because those rooms weren't generating that sound. So it was kind of a perfect storm of all of these things. Did he invent deep focus? No, there was movies that did it. Not as well. Did he invent these audio techniques? Like, no, but he's a radio guy that was bringing it to film for one of the first times, or at least this successfully. He didn't invent the long take, but he was the first to be able to employ it as well with that deep focus technique mm. and with those camera movements. So it's not like this movie made all of those things. Mm -hmm. I think it's the first movie that brought them all together, at least to my knowledge, and definitely the first one to do them all that successfully. Right. And of course, for a lot of the visual stuff, the only other people doing it, my buddies that I always <laughs> talk about, the German Expressionists. Right. Yeah, they had a lot of the visual things that he borrowed from because of all those Germans coming over to Hollywood right before World War II. You love a German Expressionist. I do. <laughs> I love their woodcuts, I love their painters, and I especially love their films. Ah. All right, enough technical stuff? Yes. Let's talk about uh, Charles Foster Kane. Okay. Because it's interesting. In This movie is just about one man's life. And any movie that is a biopic or just telling you one person's life story, it's like, this person was a hero, let's show you why. Yeah. Or this person was a villain, let's show you why. This film never quite settles on a vision of him. At least I think. He's noble, but petty. He's really self-reflective, but blind to such obvious things. I don't know is if he's a villain or a hero or... Well, of course, it's something in between. But yeah. what do you think of the man, Charles Foster Kane? I think he was... He started out very, like, innocent. And got, Naive and noble? Yeah. And, and got, was corrupted? Yeah. By? Capitalism. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I think you're just saying what I would say, but no, is that I what you feel as well? Literally, you were saying the words before I could say them. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I think that it was just the success. He was kind of corrupted by success mm. and um, his ability to kind of think one step ahead of whatever the current thinking was. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he was cutting edge in so many ways. But success is a really interesting word because I don't know if he ever felt successful. Isn't but it's successful that... in a very capitalist way for sure because yeah. he made he made the money, but he I don't know, was he happy? Yeah. I feel like that's just like a classic everybody feeling is like you don't feel like you're doing a good job or you don't feel like you're successful. And tell someone's like, no, like, you're doing really cool things. Was he doing really cool things? I don't know. He created current journalism. Yeah. Is that a good thing? No. He starts out. I love that scene. He um, gets that new newspaper. And then when he buys the staff from another newspaper to yeah. make his. And first he starts out with that... Um, what do they call it? Like a bill of principles or something yeah. like that. I can't remember the actual term. but Yeah, declaration of principles. Yeah, I think or... that's yeah. it. So he starts out with that. He starts out with a vision, and it's a benevolent vision. Yeah, He's like, I'm coming after everyone. And there was one, I can't remember what company it was, and they're like, you own that. You're doing that to yourself. And they're like, well, yeah, I, I am. But this is what's right, and this is what's just. And that's mm -hmm. how he starts off. And there's that scene then when he buys all of the other people. And that's already like a sign of like, you're just buying credibility. Yeah. You're literally buying credibility yeah. at that point. And he, they sing that song. He dances with the showgirls. And you're like, this is a charming, like... Fun moment? Yeah. Yeah. 
But you're also looking at, I think, um, oh, I forget his name now. Leland someone. The kind of best friend who he has the falling out with. I think he's already looking like uneasy about things. And you're like, this fun time, this is the beginning of the end. This is the beginning of everything changing. Because he quite soon after that starts like not necessarily making up stories, but going for sensationalism, right? right? That's really quick coming after that. And he's changing how journalism is. And it's getting more readers, so it's successful in that point. But to his declaration of principles, it is not. Yeah. And I liked in the end when Jedediah Leland yeah, that's it, sent him his principles yes, back. Yes. <laughs> and yeah, that was a, a very on-the-nose but appropriate full circle of all of them. Yeah, I agree. But what I liked also is we see so many different versions of Cain. Mm -hmm. And whether if that's from who's telling it or just the corruption of this person overall, each version is very compelling yeah. and believable. Not necessarily likable, but I want to know more about each version of him. Mm -hmm. Like when he, he is at his worst might be when he goes and uh, trashes Susan's room. Yes. That's maybe his lowest point. Yes. Arguably. I think an amazing scene. And to see, first of all, you have this 25-year-old man dressed like an 80-year-old man. Yes. For the time or not, for today even, I think the makeup's very good. Oh, the age makeup in this is amazing. Yeah. That was one thing that they got really, really right, and it was very, very impressive. I remember you. we were talking a little bit through the movie, and I was like, how do you think the makeup is on this? And you're like, yeah, I guess it's fine. And I was like, oh, that guy in this scene is 25. And you're like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> and he looks like he's like 60. Yeah. And I, yeah. So then I was like, okay, this age makeup is amazing. Yeah. Even for uh, Jed, too. And um, oh, I forget the other guy's name. I think it might be a wit's name as well. But he ages as well. And they, they do a good job of it. I think the best is on Kane himself. But the other ones are good, too. Mm-hmm. And then when he starts running for office, he's going further down that road. But again, he starts out very idealistic. Wanting to, yeah. The current governor is a literal criminal and he's going to clean up the system. He's like the mob. Yeah. yeah. That's where he's starting from. And I think it's in that speech where he says like, oh, some people call me a communist. Some people call me a fascist, but I'm an American. That's what I am. At some point he says that. And I love that because... He is America, right? He is a microcosm for America in a lot of the time. He's um, idealistic and then becomes ultimately corrupt. Yeah. And that's a very interesting take. Or maybe they didn't mean that. Maybe that's me post-World War II coming <laughs> at it because that's used in a lot of things. When we talk about the Godfather eventually, that's going to be my thesis is Michael Corleone is America. You go to war with all of this noble ambition and you, the success after that is what corrupts someone. Right. And I think that could be said here, but he isn't even post-war. This is pre-World War II. Yeah. So he can't have that insight or perhaps his insight being someone in the late 30s, early 40s, he already sees it. And I just don't have that knowledge because, you know, <laughs> yeah, I, I was born in the 80s. And then he becomes like a, a tycoon. Which is kind of a uh, American dream, right? To be the tycoon. Yeah, that's and, the goal. Yeah, and we always talk about all of these tycoons as good things, but then you're like, they're all terrible. Yeah. And they, the world is worse because of them. Yes. And he is no exception at after a certain point because yeah. the tycoon is this like champion of all the right-wing causes of imperialism. And he, in his newspaper life, starts a war yeah for the sake of writing about it he's like oh no the war is real because i said it's real and brags about it yeah the man who has a declaration of principles then starts a war just so he can write about it yeah and that's, have the scoop that's the downfall right yeah yeah he gets corrupted and it's not pretty <laughs> i guess <laughs> and then i think if i want to be more heavy-handed, and you know that I do. Oh, I love you. You love a heavy hand. <laughs> <laughs> if uh, when Susan is talking about, you talk about people like you own them. 
the whole like, well, you got to love me. Yeah. I'll give you anything, but you got to love me. That seems like as a non-American kind of um, like, like America, that it's America's right to bestow something upon you. The American dream. Yeah. Uh, this freedom that you have if you come there. But you better fucking love it. Yeah. You better tell everyone you love it. Yeah. If you don't. Like, you are at fault, and you're not deserving of what you get for that's being there. anti-American. That's anti-American. Yeah. If you say there's anything wrong, that's anti-American. Yeah. And that's why I think my whole thing about uh, Kane just being America isn't, isn't that crazy. Yeah, I agree. And if anything, it's just like a dark take on the American dream, which usually you see in all of those 70s movies that I love. And I guess maybe that's why I really for all the character work on this because it seems reminiscent of a lot of those disillusioned 70s movies that I love so much because you have the American dream that this child from nothing who lives in a boarding house in the middle of nowhere Mm -hmm. becomes the world's richest man, a great businessman, a leader of people, of empires, but he dies broken and alone. Yeah. Wells, as early as 1941, is saying, like, no, the American dream's a sham. Yeah. He knew it in the 40s. And that's, it's interesting to see the American dream from, like, the other side. Because they feel like there's so much media out there being, like, the American dream is wonderful. Yeah. And yay, little neighborhoods full of busy bodies. <laughs> and, like, just a lot of, like, sunny golden cast kind of Mm -hmm. views and it's i haven't seen all the 1970s movies you have so maybe you have a better view of the other side but i think it was really interesting to see how corrupted he got and how it impacted his entire life yeah and it's so interesting that it's happening in a movie in 1941 because I don't have the the best film knowledge, but the 70s were a time where that really started taking hold, then went away from the 80s and 90s. And in like the late 90s and early 2000s, that starts coming back. Mm -hmm. But that type of tone was was not common. And I wonder if it's just something he was doing as a character piece. And now looking at it this far away, we can kind of imbue it with that anti-American dream thing. But he must see it. I think... With everything that's going on here, Mm -hmm. the people are too smart to do that accidentally. Yeah, I agree. I think it's on purpose. Yeah. Do you have any other thoughts about like what is his driving force throughout this? I feel like part of it is that he had this like childhood trauma of being sent away from his mother to like have this golden life, this better life, right? Which is like a big thing in most movies. And so I think he was trying so, so hard to not only make his mother's dream for him come true, but also to like make sure that he never went back there again. Yeah, that's an interesting... I haven't looked at it like that, but I have a a very similar like thought that is uh, the same, but also like a twist on that. Because all of these things that we're talking about are like complex and like oh maybe and if you look at it this way yeah but i think at its most basic level that this is a boy who was given up by his mother yes was loved by his mother and maybe nobody else we think at first that his father loves him because he's saying like oh don't don't send him around away but then the mom says something about like well what do you care you just beat him all the time yeah and then we're like oh shit so the mom is the one looking out for for him and the performance of the mom, there's not much of it, but I really like it. She seemed tortured to make that decision. She did. You could she's, see the emotion on her face. Yeah. But she's doing it for what she thinks is the best. Yeah. I think. But to Kane, he is a man who loved one person or was loved by one person. Yes. Was given up by that person and is just doing everything in his life to be loved. Yeah. And doesn't know how to go about doing it. Yeah. I heard, I can't remember which writer it was, but some writer wrote an article about Trump and they talked about him being a man who is trying his hardest to be loved by everyone and in doing so makes everyone hate him Mm -hmm. because he just doesn't know how to do it. So he's like, how about this? How about this? How about this? Yeah. And Kane is doing that. And the similarities on Trump and Kane don't stop there. (laughs) Yikes. Uh, There's actually like, if you want to YouTube it, there's somebody asks Donald Trump about Citizen Kane and he... uh, 
this is before he was the president, right. but still An during idiot. being piece yeah. of shit. And um, he talks about it, and it's like surreal to see someone who is our time's closest thing to Kane yeah. break down the movie. And uh, if you want just a spoiler, he doesn't say anything insightful, so don't worry. But it is really <laughs> interesting to see, like, he has. A, such a warped take on it yeah or maybe i do you know like i'm i'm one dude i haven't read all the criticism on kane in a long time but i think most people probably are closer to my side of things yeah, than, than donald Trump's. trump <laughs> although um he was voted in to become president so what do i know Ugh. but either way he has some really weird takes on it and you're like well of course you would think that so that's kind of fun so yeah i think on its most basic level he's a man who was given up hasn't experienced love and is trying to get it and he's just trying to buy it yeah does he love anything i don't know it doesn't seem like it i i don't have a good answer to that it seems like he loves what he doesn't have yeah i, and then I when feel he has like, it he doesn't love it anymore i feel like he's one of those people who like strives so hard for something that he doesn't take the time to like enjoy the the like things that come with success yeah because you could look at his first marriage as at the time it seems like it's straight love mm -hmm. because when he comes back from that trip and he's in his white suit or whatever that's a man in love yeah if you look at it having seen the movie though you're thinking maybe this is a man who is trying to prove his legitimacy yeah he just inherited this he didn't do anything to get that gold mine yeah and he's trying to prove that like yes i should be in charge of this newspaper yes i should have greater political ambitions later and i to show that i am marrying the niece of the president i think is who the she niece was of the president yeah so he's trying to say that i belong maybe that's there but even if that's not there you can look at it and say he was in love, perhaps, mm -hmm. or at least showed it to, at the very least. But that goes away once he has that thing right. because he just wants more. He's he like wants what he doesn't have. Checking boxes. Yeah. Yeah. Or maybe he's like, this is what will make me happy. Gets it and it doesn't make him happy. So this is what's going like, to yeah. make me happy. He gets it, doesn't make him happy. Yeah. So there's I, I so think, many ways to look at this movie. And I think that's why. Above all of that technical stuff I talked about, why it's still talked about and mm -hmm. why film theorists and uh, people doing film criticism go to this movie so much is I could write a paper on any one of those single sentences and back it up with a lot of stuff because mm -hmm. there's so much in this movie. Right. And like, who's to say you're wrong, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, talking about things that he seemingly loves, gives up everything for, and uh, then treats like shit... Let's talk a little bit about Susan Alexander. Oh yeah, because I feel like that's the we could talk about the other characters, but I don't have I don't have nearly as much to say about mm, them. No, yeah. Why is he with Susan? I think from the beginning, when he wanders into her parlor, mm -hmm. uh, he likes the idea that she doesn't know who he is. Yes, whereas his first wife. Like, it was kind of a prestige marriage. Yeah, for both of them. For both of them. So meeting Susan and realizing that she's, like, kind of simple. She's very small town. She doesn't have a lot of huge ambitions for herself. Mm -hmm. And uh, she has this dream, but she kind of gave it up. And I think he sees her as this way to be able to, like, make someone else happy while... Yeah bringing someone into his life who doesn't really care about how rich he is. Yeah, and I feel like the fact that she doesn't know who he is links her to his pre-money life. Yes. To his mother. I and, Okay, I was going to say that. I was going to yeah. say that she seems like... Uh, like an embodiment of his mother and he wasn't able to help his mother maybe as much as he wanted to before she passed or maybe if you look at it more pessimistically he feels that his mother didn't love him yeah. gave him away and now he's going to win that love in the form of susan yeah i think it's we're both saying the same thing but i just have a darker take on it perhaps <laughs> yeah i'm yeah. trying to be positive because the mom did do well for herself she made a lot of money every year yeah so it's not like she was left alone out there. We don't really know what happened to her. Yeah. And my assumption, which like is coming from, from nothing, yeah. really, but is that 
perhaps he felt uh, rejected Mm -hmm. and never went back Mm -hmm. before she passed. Yeah. I don't know. And now he sees this person who kind of has nothing, comes from nothing. Mm -hmm. He can elevate her in a way that, like, I'm sure she wouldn't have even dreamed of. Yeah. And I don't think she did dream of because when she said the business about her being a singer... I think it's also kind of tempered with the idea of like, oh, my mother wanted me to be that. Yeah. It's not like she really, really wants to be an opera singer. No. But then he kind of forces this opera career on her. Yeah. I think his treatment of Susan parallels not exactly, um, I forget who manages his money, uh, but that guy. And if you're like, wait, could a bank just raise a child? That seems ridiculous. Uh, that happened to Orson Welles. Oh, really? Yeah. He was raised and put in a trust by like some businessman. Huh. And that's how he grew up. So yeah, that happens and happened at the time. But uh, Welles does say that that guy was great and he loves him. So, huh. But um, you could say that it his treatment of Susan parallels like his own treatment. Yeah. He was given all this money with like no idea what to do with it mm-hmm. and was forced to be something maybe against his will. And then he does the same thing to her, whether it's him doing it to her in hopes of better results or to that he thinks that he will achieve something secondhand through her. That's all up for debate. But it definitely seems to be a really similar situation in a lot of ways. Yeah. And then he like forces her into this thing where in the beginning of the movie, um, Mr. Thatcher, the banker. That's who I meant. Yeah. He is like, no, let's go over your stock holdings. Let's go over your business. Let's go over how much you make a year. And he's like, there's this like teeny tiny little paper that I own now. I want that. Yeah. Whereas everything else is like this huge dream that someone else is putting on him. Why does he want to do all those things again? Or like, what does he want to be? Everything you hate. Yeah. That's my favorite line of the whole movie. Yeah. Because that sums him up. It's so much. All of these things he does, it seems, are out of spite. Not because he's like, yeah. this is what will do it. But I feel sometimes he stayed with Susan because we have that showdown where his wife and the uh, the guy he's running against come there. Yeah. And Gettys, I think his name Gettys, was. Because he's yeah. yelling, Gettys! <laughs> I love that yelling also. But... It's not like we really see a love between them. I think we do initially. Uh Uh-huh. But it's not played up as a love story. And I'll talk about that in a moment. But it seems like he chooses Susan almost out of spite. Of like, you think I won't stay here? Let you run all that that campaign stuff and still win? I'll do it. Yeah. I'm a fucking madman. I'll do whatever. (laughs) And he's doing it out of spite. And then her career, he seems to do out of spite yeah, as well. Yeah, he's like forcing it on her. And early on, though, it seems like you were saying that this is as close to his childhood as he can get. Because he's so far removed from that. But he sees that she doesn't know who he is. He goes to her place. It's the only other small room we see mm-hmm. since we have seen his um, like cabin or whatever you call it. Yeah. The place where he grew up. And he's kind of seeing that maybe I can regain that innocence here. Because do you remember, it's a throwaway line, but I think there's something to it. Because they ask, she asks him where he was going at the time. And I think it might be just after his mother died. Mm. And he's going to a warehouse to see his mother's belongings. Yeah, yeah. What do you think he's hoping to find in that warehouse? Rosebud. Rosebud. Yeah. He was going to see Rosebud. He was going to reclaim that symbol of his lost innocence Mm -hmm. and youth. And then he meets Susan Alexander, who is another symbol of his lost innocence and youth, who he then himself corrupts just as he was corrupted. Mm Mm-hmm. I just came up with that. Well, it didn't come up. I'm sure somebody said it because it's Citizen <laughs> Kane. But to me, I just came up with that. I think it holds. I think that holds. Yeah. And then also, when he's with her, he behaves like a child. Remember, he's doing shadow puppets and stuff? Yeah. And they're just like singing songs and hanging out. There's like a playfulness to and it. And that's the first time we see him playing since he was playing with Rosebud. Another scene I loved with them is after one of her performances, maybe it's the first big one, that angry clap scene. Yeah. That was 
brilliant to me because that is a man doing everything out of spite yeah that is a man who's like yeah i fucked up too bad i'm not gonna like no i'm not not admitting it yeah no we're gonna keep going but then he kind of does admit it because he goes and writes the review he finishes jed's review and he doesn't say like yep she was great and everything he butchers her yeah but why do you think he does that uh I think he's trying to prove that he's non-biased. Yeah, he's proving a point to Jed now. Yeah. He's just like, whatever, I'll do whatever I want just to prove you wrong. Yeah. And he'll like make his wife furious despite all this time trying to do the exact opposite and make her into something amazing. Yeah. He then is willing to just tear her down because it'll prove something to Jed. He's like, you think I don't have principles? Look at this. Yeah. But that is just another indication of, of him not having those principles. Yeah. Wow. Man, I think this movie's really good. I really <laughs> do. And he like, yeah, just turns her into a point and then she tries to kill herself. Yeah. It gets dark. It stays dark. It does. It's a pretty dark movie. It is. It is. And like I, I mentioned a little bit uh, a while ago, but... There's not a romance to this. No. Like you'd say like, oh, there's like nice meat cute thing and whatever. Uh, apparently Wells hated that bit because really? he said the, the mud that splashes on his face is like slapsticky and silly. And it, yeah, it kind of is. It kind of is. I thought that was a little tonally awkward. <laughs> but what I meant about there not being a real romance story is if you look at any other movie from this era, women are shot a certain way when they're the romantic lead. And uh, you could read... Yesterday, this is a little insight into our lives. I was on a ladder trimming hedges, and I said, "Like, oh, that, I was just thinking about Citizen Kane." It reminded me of that Laura Mulvey article from <laughs> 1992, which I, of course, didn't read then, but I read when I was a, a teenager yeah. studying this, and I somehow still have that knowledge. And there's all this stuff about the um, the feminine gaze, and in cinema. Men are watching women voyeuristically, mm-hmm. and women are watching men watch women, and that holds up for a lot of cinema. Yeah. Women are shot differently, different types of women are leads than men. Mm-hmm. There's like, I don't think I have to tell anyone who's made it this far into this episode <laughs> yeah. or you that uh, women aren't treated well in film. No, so this movie. The women aren't treated well by the characters, but I think the film does them justice because they aren't treated in that romantic way because Cain doesn't have that romantic inclination. Mm -hmm. They are treated by the lens just as the other characters are, which is at the disposal of Cain. Yeah. And it's not exactly like feminist that this movie is treating women poorly, but it is treating them as equals, and that is poorly in uh, by Kane. Whew. It's a many layered thing. This movie or feminism in cinema? Uh, both. All of the above. <laughs> I think um, Mulvey wrote an entire book on uh, a feminist look at Citizen Kane. So go check that out. I only read excerpts of it when I was a, a teenager. But they they stuck with me a little bit, so I kind of remember them. That's good. And when he comes into her room, I think he thinks that she is, like, working that street. Oh, yeah. Because when he walks in, he takes charge, closes the door. Right. And she's like, uh, no, my landlady wouldn't like that, and opens it up. And then he's, like, not sure what to do. Yeah. That was, like, an interesting thing. Is He's... In, in a lot of movies, it would be like, yeah, he closes the door and they make out and that's the romance. Yeah. And that you don't get that in this movie. No, there's not a lot of really romantic moments. I don't think uh, Susan is a particularly well-treated in the by the writers in the sense of that she is like a good character. Like she's not a nice person. Mm-mm. She's not a relatable person a lot of the time. But I think what you could say is that she is not one of the typical women of a 1940s film who when the door is closed goes like okay now he does what he wants Mm -hmm. she's not that and even in all of the control that kane has but really he has a lot of control over the whole world she pushes back more than anyone yeah huh she never becomes what he wants but nobody ever can because whatever he wants is what he doesn't have yeah his mom yeah (laughs) <laughs> yeah, may very well be. This might be issues. very. I think there's probably dozens of 
thousands of papers about the, <laughs> this as a Probably. like an Oedipal reading of yeah. this, and that his mom is a or um, Susan is a stand-in for his mom, and yeah. I but I think of it less as in the literal and Oedipal sense in that she is just more a representation of that lost life, not literally like, you're like my mom. Yeah. But you you remind me of that life that my mom also reminds me of. Yeah. Because that's when I had it. Yeah. Whoa, man. Whoa. Well, I think we've been talking for way longer than I expected, but <laughs> maybe we should get into, well, we, we had to get into Rosebud. Yes. Rosebud. Well, I loved your uh, take that you gave early on. So if you'd please uh, elaborate for us, what do you think Rosebud represents in this film? A simpler time in his life where he wasn't like the center of the universe in the city that he lives in and uh, something he's trying to get back to. Yeah, it seems like that is... It's hard to argue with that. Yeah. That seems eloquently said, and I would agree. And <laughs> Great. Done. <laughs> the end. <laughs> oh, 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 you'd love that, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> it's what he had the last time he felt like he had what he needed. Yeah. Since then, he has so much more, but feels like he needs so much more. He's always amassing more statues, more animals, more wives, more newspapers. He just wants more, and he can never get to the point where he is satiated. But he had that point, and the last time he had it, all he had was that sled and that life. Yeah. And the sled is the most clear symbol of that. Because when... um, I forget his name again already. You told me a while ago, but the banker comes to take him away, essentially. Mr. Thatcher. What does he use to fight off Thatcher? He physically uses the sled to push away this symbol of corruption or of capitalism or of this empty life or whatever. All of that rolled into one. He's using that sled. And it was fun watching this movie because this is only the second time I've ever seen it. And the first time was when I was 18. (laughs) Um You can see all the sled stuff early on. They talk about the sled a lot. And at the time, you're like, whatever, some fucking sled. I don't know. (laughs) But now when you know what it is, you're like, oh, wow. I didn't realize they were that clear in setting up the sled that early on in the movie. But if you're not looking for it, why would you care about some things about a sled? You don't know where the movie's going even. Exactly, yeah. And I think if you look at it in a certain light, you can see all of this as a rejection of capitalism that... She gave him a better life with the money that she had than he ever could with having all the money in the world, right? Mm-hmm. It's saying that, that that capitalist system is ultimately hollow and empty because he he won. He won capitalism. Yeah, he, he was the king of capitalism. What did it get him? Nothing. Nothing. It got him, it got him everything and nothing, right? Yeah. He had everything he could ask for and still wanted more. While when he was living this simple life and was fulfilled in a more simple way, he had all he needed. Mm-hmm. Of course, that's probably like really naive and reductive way to look at it, but that's that's in there, I think. I feel like that's like a certain way that people look at the past, like ah, in the back, in the yeah. old days when things were easier. Well, it's just a thing, a way to look at childhood, yeah. right? When you don't know as much, or you could say when you don't have to be part of the capitalist machine Mm -hmm. you are happier yeah but i do like the whole rosebud thing because like this is a a mystery at its heart like it is a a, a character study Mm -hmm. but it's plotted like a like a mystery and being a mystery it's so I don't know, bizarre, innovative, one of those things that it simultaneously offers a resolution. It says, like, look, Rosebud was the sled. You just, like, wipe your hands, you're done. That's it. Rosebud was the sled. But before that, it has the reporter saying, I don't think any word can explain a man's life. No, I guess Rosebud is just a piece in a jigsaw puzzle, a missing piece. Mm. So you're saying, like, he all he wanted was rosebud here it is but then you're also saying like well that doesn't really mean anything that doesn't yeah. tell you anything that's just one piece of all of this and they have that line of like you can't sum up a man's life in one word and i think that whole part was maybe the most 
interesting part of this movie that we are drawn to look for one answer. We find that answer and the movie tells you like, well, that's not the answer though. Mm -hmm. No one is one thing. And I think that that take from this movie, that this is a movie about a man of complexity, a man who you can think is just about one thing and then give you that one thing. And then you realize like, no, that's, that's not it. Yeah. That's a piece of it. As is all of this, as are all of these people of all of their retellings of what may or may not have happened. It's all just a piece. And that's maybe my single favorite thing about Citizen Kane in a time now where there's not a lot of nuance in characters, either in movies or in how we look on um, celebrities or something like I'm not going to get into celebrities who have like some sort of scandal then now we're like oh yeah well now you can't be in any movies because that's what you are right that's one thing and that's i don't think exactly what is going on here but we have a thing in how journalism works how media works how film works that like well what is that person are they the hero or the villain Mm -hmm. and we hate gray areas and this movie is two hours of showing you that everything's gray yeah and that's what I love about it. And I think I love this movie. And that should have been my final soliloquy because that was kind of good, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, before we get into that part of things, are there any little other fun things that you liked about this movie? Um, I think we've covered most of them. Uh, I just felt like I kind of, you know, how I get on a kick and then I kind of like dominate the conversation. Yeah. yeah. We Listen, We've done six Step Up movies in a row. <laughs> I now got Citizen Kane. I got something to like yeah. sink my teeth into and I'm just going for it. Yeah. <laughs> but that's what makes your episodes great is that you always have a lot of really like insightful stuff to talk about. Whereas I'm like, dance. No, but we got into some <laughs> we insightful did, we stuff. We did. I don't know. If you like this episode on Citizen Kane, you should hear us talk about Step Up 3D because I think we had a lot of good things to say. I think we did, yeah. It was a it was a fun kind of journey that we took. It was some notes that I took that we never talked about. I love the newspapers in this movie. That when he is going to lose the election, the two headlines they think about running are Kane wins or fraud at polls. Yeah. So you're like, oh, I either lost or I was cheated, and yeah. that seems a pretty. Trumpy as well, right? Yeah, that's actually I, from the little tiny bit of research that I did. When Hearst ran for um, mayor of New York, he ran against someone who's supposed to be Jim W. Gettys. Mm-hmm. He's like, it's modeled after this actual person. Yeah. And there was fraud at the polls. Oh, or was there or did he say there was? No, there was fraud at the polls. And uh, apparently the opponent's people dumped a bunch of ballots into the East River. Oh. And so they were like, actually was fraud at the polls. That's interesting. Yeah. I just came across that as I was clicking through um, characters. (laughs) Um, Another fun newspaper thing was I love that they put singer in quotes yeah. for Citizen. Like, what a dig. That's yeah. unnecessary. And another really interesting thing is they spell her name wrong in one of the headlines. Do they? Yeah, so it's saying, like, she doesn't matter. They don't no, care about nobody's this. fact-checking this, yeah. even though it's, like, the boss's wife. Well, I think this was rival ones. Oh, okay, so they don't care. Yeah. Yeah. It's insulting. Yeah, they're going for the... Um, the sensationalism. Yeah. They don't want the journalism. And the or maybe it might have been his at that point, because at that point, he's like that too. Yeah. Whoa. Whoa, man. Whoa, man. Well, do you have any final thoughts on uh, Citizen Kane? I know you don't love it, but do you maybe appreciate or like it? I appreciate it. I liked it. I think it's important and that a lot of like future movies kind of... A lot of future movies were kind of like helped by this movie, I think, mm. uh, and some of the tactics and styles that they used, uh, tactics, film tactics. Yeah, I think that works. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I can see why it's important. I'll take it. It was nice. <laughs> <laughs> if nothing else, 
it was really fun to talk about right it now. was yeah this was really interesting and i always love the ones the films you bring that come with like a history lesson yeah <laughs> and like a film lesson <laughs> oh this was a, like a, a mini episode of indie's film school yeah some of them how it went further into it yes. this had a good bit at the beginning yeah i think i i always learn something and i kind of enjoy getting those little snippets and the home audience can't tell but when you watch movies now, you're so critical about things. <laughs> and I just look and I was like, yes. yes. <laughs> You've changed me. For the worst. Now you hate movies so much more. There's movies that you was like, were like, I used to love this movie. And I yeah. hate it. I'm just ruining your life. You are <laughs> not ruining my life. <laughs> I'm making the other parts better. But you're film watching. Worse. <laughs> Yeah, but, you used to be able to just like turn on a movie and be like, oh, this is nice. But your um, eating has gone up yeah. way more. No, then not in quantity, but in quality. Yes. <laughs> That's what I've done. I if, uh, It's making your movie watching way worse, though. Yeah. It's a trade off. I think a it's a better trade off. A little of this, a little of that. Yeah. <laughs> So do you have any closing thoughts? Do you? <laughs> uh, of course I do. Although, what are your, what are your closing like thoughts? I uh, kind of went on a few tangents and you can tell. People at home don't know, but I start moving my hands and looking upwards. Yeah. <laughs> so that's how you can tell I'm really you really going, but... like, yeah, you perform to the whole room. <laughs> the whole kitchen gets it. <laughs> I, I just hope that um, if someone listened this far, they probably have seen the movie. Mm -hmm. But I think... When we look upon things with such high esteem, like, oh, it's the greatest movie of all time. Right. It makes it challenging and inaccessible. Yeah. And I didn't really want to watch this movie that day. Because it's like, oh, it's such a big thing and I got to think. But I think the fun thing to do with a movie like this is throw it on. Watch it. Yeah. If you want to talk about it like we do, do it. That's a lot of fun. Yeah. If you want to think about it, go for it. I think it's fun. A lot of people don't. That's cool. Yeah. But it's worth watching. Yeah. If you just like movies in general, it's worth watching. If you're into the history of it, of course, it's a 100% you must watch. If you're into film history or um, like cinema criticism, anything like that, for sure, 100% mm -hmm. watch it. But if you just like storytelling, I think that part of it is underserved in how much we talk about it. Because this movie, like these great sets were awesome. But that's not what did it for me. It mm -hmm. was all the character stuff. And I think it holds on for, it's 80 years, 80 plus years that this movie came out. Wow. And it doesn't feel that dated. It is dated. Of course, it's from course. the 40s. It yeah. has to be. But it doesn't feel so inaccessible if you just look at it like you would anything else. And there's so many different readings you can put on this movie. And that's part of why it's so, so lasting. Like it predicts that trump style of fake news it mm -hmm. puts forth an idea that kane is post-war america even though this is pre <laughs> pre-war pre -war, yeah and it's just fun to watch orson wells being this charismatic lead which i didn't know he was because i yeah. know this old orson wells if you okay this is another youtube thing i'll put a link i think <laughs> you have to watch orson wells as an old man doing commercials and he's just fucking wrecked and yelling at people. Oh. And it's just, he's just like, he's. Oh, I don't like that. Yeah, that's that's the Orson Welles that a lot of people know. To watch mm. this like young idealist artist. Right. Actor, director, writer, all of this on stage, on screen, doing what he's best at. It's amazing to watch. And it also seems like a criticism of uh, the press coverage or modern cinema that don't let these characters live in that, that gray area that I was talking about or be more than one thing. We reduce everyone to one thing. Mm -hmm. And this is an opposition and a criticism of that. And I don't know if this is the best movie ever. It's not my favorite movie ever. It's not in my top 50 favorite movies. Hmm. It's just not. I don't, I don't love it like that. But when you add all of those things to the fact that this fundamentally changed the way that movies look, feel, and sound, and you have that narrative of a like young protege, like genius kid coming out and going up against this petty tyrant who ruled the media empire, mm -hmm. you add that into it with all of the changes it made to cinema, like if it's not the best movie, it's not my favorite movie, it's undoubtedly one of the most important 
and interesting and influential movies ever made. So it's it's worth a watch. All I can say is it's worth a watch. Okay. We recommend it. Yeah. <laughs> that being said, I'm not going to give it a 10 out of 10 when we do our scores. No? No. What are you going to give it? Eight or nine. Okay. Yeah. It's important, but we rate on how much we like it. Yes. I don't like this as much as Chunking Express. I don't want to watch it again now. I can watch Chunking Express and like, yeah, let's put it on again. Okay. I can, it, it doesn't have that rewatchability to me. And to a lot of people, it does. And I don't think it's so inaccessible. So yeah, just give it a watch. Hmm. Okay. That's Indy's recommendations. It's um, Citizen Kane. Give it a watch. <laughs> yeah. You know what the tagline for Citizen Kane was when it came out? I think it's just Citizen Kane. It's terrific. Yeah, there's um, a poster here that I'm actually looking at. It says, everybody's talking about it. It's terrific. Orson Welles, Citizen Kane. That that was their catchphrase. Yeah, it's that was terrific. Their tagline. It's terrific. They really uh, oversold was saying, it. It's terrible. It's the worst movie ever made. That's yeah. what the, the a lot of people were right. saying because they were paid to say that. Yeah. So Citizen Kane, it's terrific. It's terrific. Everybody's talking about it. <laughs> So our second sponsor of the episode is Alberta Treasury Branch. And at Alberta Treasury Branch, they make banking work for you by offering both expert and practical advice in saving, budgeting, and paying off debt. And though your financial situation and the economy may change over time, you can be confident that your money is safe and secure with ATB. We have a history of doing what's right for our clients, especially when times are tough, because ATB was built to help Albertans. For more information, you can visit atb.com. All right, well, that wraps up our Citizen Kane episode. You know who has been involved in, I think, the most movies we've talked about on this uh, podcast now? Orson Welles. No, this is the first one. Oh. (laughs) Bernard Herrmann. Who did the score for this, Psycho, The Day the Earth Stood Still, and I think one other one. Bernard Herrmann is the shit. He's amazing. Wow. That's exciting. Yeah. We're big Herrmann fans. Oh, I I already knew I was. Um, And we watched a little Citizen Kane in pop culture. You watched that episode of The Simpsons? Yeah. Called Rosebud? Yeah. And there's other ones, too. There's another episode where he... Does a whole, I'm C. Montgomery Burns, and throws things around like the, I'm Charles Foster Kane. Right. Gettys. That scene, when the audio cuts out, when they slam the door. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Oh, we're done. We're done though, right? We're done. Okay. (laughs) There's a whole White Stripe song where every line in the song is a line from Citizen Kane. Really? Maybe. We'll link all of this for you. (laughs) I I could just keep going, but we're done. We're done. We're done. Nobody wants to hear anymore. (laughs) (laughs) So we'll see you next week when Indy and I bring you our spoiler-free things of the week and we find out what I will be bringing to the podcast. And all you have to do is follow up against Citizen Game. <laughs> yeah, great. <laughs> I hope there's dancing. We'll see. We will. <laughs> next week. Okay, bye. bye. Everyone.